Okay, thank you. As I said, my name is Pete Damiano, <laughs> and I direct the University of Iowa Public Policy Center. And welcome to Policy Challenges for Iowa and the Nation. Uh, this is a series of discussions about some of the most important issues that affect policy in the United States. And as uh, we do at the Public Policy Center, and we're doing this event in collaboration with the Iowa Board of Regents and the College of Law, uh, we like to bring differing perspectives on th these different issues together, share that information with the university community and beyond. We think that's a really important role for a public university, and particularly the University of Iowa. So we're very excited for the speakers we have tonight and that all of you are here either in person or online. And I'm going to start by introducing the 22nd president of the University of Iowa, Barbara Wilson. And Barbara has been here now for a little over two months. And so we're really pleased that she is here and she's going to provide a welcome for us. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. I appreciate it. And welcome, everyone. It's a, it's a delight to be here in this beautiful building and this beautiful room. And welcome to all of our guests and visitors. We're really excited to have you here uh, tonight. As many of you know, free speech is fundamental to academic enterprise. We talk all the time about the importance of multiple perspectives, vigorous debate, academic freedom, First Amendment rights, and we encourage our students in and out of the classroom to think about all the different perspectives and make decisions for themselves about what they believe and what they think after they have all the information at hand. So uh, this is part of our mission. It's part of our value system, and I'm really thrilled that we're hosting an event like this tonight to have vigorous debate because as it turns out it's really easy to say that we have these values but sometimes it's hard to actually implement and enact them uh, and I would say especially during these times where we're really confronted with a lot of um, less than civil behavior around tough issues we have social media challenges we have a lot of information and disinformation out there. And so helping our students and our faculty and our staff wade through the complex issues around free speech is really part of what we need to be doing all the time. I'm really excited to tell you that we do have a free speech link on our main page of our home uh, page. So if any of you are curious about what we stand for and what we're doing on this front, I would encourage you to look at our, our home page and follow the link on free speech. And we've got a lot of sources there, including some readings and some ways for students to get involved. We have a, um, a, an initiative, I'm going to find the name of it for a minute here, it's um, called the Hawkeye, um, sorry, uh, uh, Engaged Hawkeye Initiative, where we encourage students to actually get involved in thinking about issues related to free speech. So I think we're, we're doing a lot of work and we can always do more, and this evening represents an example of that. So thank you to the Public Policy Center and to the law school for supporting this and for putting this on. And now I'm really delighted to introduce one of our regents here this evening. David Barker is a great supporter of our university. He's been involved in helping us think about issues related to free speech. He's been on our board since March of 2019. And as many of you know, he's a partner in Barker Companies, which owns, manages, and develops apartments and real estate across this community and outside this community. Uh, he previously, I just learned this today as I was looking at his bio, was an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York where he conducted research on real estate and the banking industry. Most importantly, he's been a great friend and supporter to me as I've ventured into my new role as president, and he's a great supporter of this university. So please join me in welcoming David Barker. Well, thank you, President Wilson. Uh, we are so happy uh, that you're here. Uh, and uh, it just can't tell you uh, what a great job you're doing and what a difference you're making here already. Um, so the purpose of a university is the production and dissemination of knowledge. But as knowledge is produced, disagreements almost always arise. Disagreements can be settled by decree or repression but then the result is dogma, not knowledge. Knowledge results from the discussion of disagreements, and sometimes that feels like intellectual combat, 
Some ideas win, some lose, some are synthesized with others to form new ideas. But that process works best when intellectual combat is friendly and the goal of both sides is truth, not victory. So in this series, uh, we hope to promote that kind of dialogue that leads to knowledge, better policies, and better understanding of each other. We will take on tough issues, and we won't be afraid to debate, but we hope to make friends and work together to find the truth. Uh, I want to thank uh, Pete Damiano uh, for all of his work putting this together. Thanks to Kevin Washburn uh, and Keith Saunders for their guidance. Uh, thanks to Barb Wilson uh, for her support and to the Free Speech Committee of the Board of Regents uh, for their encouragement of this project. And especially thank you to Senators uh, Zach Walls and Amy Sinclair uh, for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. So again, thanks very much. Thank you, David, and really do appreciate the fact that the Board of Regents has been supportive and engaged in this, and having this kind of discussion here, I think, is, is really important, as well as with our legislators that are here and our, our outside experts that we're going to be hearing from. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Washburn, Dean of the Law School, a friend and colleague, and a, an expert on a lot of the things that we're going to be talking. He'll be introducing the panel and some other experts from his law school there. Thank you so much, Pete. Really appreciate it. I do have a modest role here, and I'll try to get through it quickly, but we've got some really great people here tonight, and so I just need to, to I'm going to introduce them all now so we don't have to take too much time during the, during the event. First, our keynote speakers. Um, we have Mike Davis. Mike is a double Hawkeye, and he's one of Iowa's most loyal alums. He comes anytime we need him. His professional life has been between, split between Colorado and Washington, D.C., I guess the mountains and the swamp or something like that. Um, one of his most notable career moves has been clerking um, for a, a, a judge um, on two separate occasions, once in Colorado and then for the same judge when he was on the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. So that's Justice Gorsuch. And um, then more recently, um, he worked for Senator Grassley on the Senate Judiciary Committee and, and was responsible for a record number of appointees, including another justice, getting another justice ushered onto the court. Um, Mike left the Judiciary Committee in 2019 and has worked on a number of special initiatives um, since that time. The most relevant uh, one for tonight is the Internet Accountability Project. Um, Mike will provide his own influential perspective on uh, First Amendment and social media, and um, he knows what he is talking about. He has indeed himself been banned from Twitter. <laughs> not once, not twice. <laughs> Not three times, <laughs> but four times. Um, so he knows what he's talking about from a personal perspective, too. Um, he's probably got thoughts about the private regulation of free speech in the modern public square. square. Um, so thank you for returning to Iowa City once again, Mike, to be with us. Our next keynote speaker, who will be on screen, she's appearing virtually, is an accomplished journalist and a former correspondent with the Associated Press, a, a national editor with the Associated Press. She also cares about freedom and civil liberty, liberties. She is an academic and a lawyer um, who serves on the board, uh, the national board of the ACLU. Um, she is currently on the faculty at Simmons University in Boston, um, where, she, where her teaching and scholarship focuses on media, law, and ethics during the digital age. In looking at her distinguished biography and professional background, there was a role that especially stood out for tonight's program, and that is that it, she is a media ethicist. Um, our hope is that she will, in part, provide a perspective from our country's fourth estate for this evening. Um, we're looking forward to your perspective on all these things, Professor Griffith. Our final keynote speaker is Carl Zabo. Thank you for being part of our program, Carl. Carl serves as vice president and general counsel of NetChoice, NetChoice is an advocacy organization slash um, think tank in Washington, D.C. Um, that has members that include many social media companies such as Google, Facebook, and Twitter, but also commercial company, more commercial companies like Amazon and PayPal and VRBO. NetChoice works hard to preserve the internet as a place for free enterprise and free expression. You can also call him Professor Zabo because he has an adjunct appointment at George Mason University at the Antonin Scalia Law School. 
And now, Mike, I'm not trying to cause trouble here, but Carl will tell you he is the conservative on the panel here because he is an originalist on the First Amendment and he believes in free enterprise and small government. So he's the conservative, not you, got that? Um, he has worked with the Federal Trade Commission in the past and worked with the White House in past administrations for on cybersecurity issues. So Carl is also an Eagle Scout, and I've always been impressed by anyone who could accomplish that. Um, Carl will provide a perspective sort of on behalf of social media um, companies uh, for tonight. Now, following the keynote speakers, we have two other very special guests. We have um, Senators Sinclair and Walls, and they will offer an Iowa political perspective on, on the conversation. Senator Amy Sinclair represents Iowa District 14. Thank you for being here tonight, Senator Sinclair. Prior to her election, Senator Sinclair held various positions in education, including working for public school districts in South Central Iowa, and also teaching at Southwestern Community College. Um, she also served two terms on the Wayne County uh, Board of Supervisors before joining the General Assembly in Iowa and also worked for the Daily Iowegian newspaper in Centerville. So she's got a little journalism credentials too. Um, she drives from a wide range of experiences and we're lucky to have her here. Um, she's already had many leadership roles. Um, she's been in the Senate for nine years and um, we're very grateful for her support. Thank you. Senator Zach Walls uh, is also here. He represents Iowa Senate District 37 and you're not sitting in his district, but you could probably, but you could probably, <laughs> you could probably throw a baseball into it from here. Um, prior to his election, um, Zach worked primarily as an advocate in the LGBTQ rights movement. And I think it's fair to say that he has become a national figure for his work, even though it's been here in Iowa and really made a difference in Iowa and beyond. And um, he is a best-selling um, author of a memoir about his warm and nurturing family. And um, like, like um, Carl, um, Senator uh, Walls is an Eagle Scout also. So we've got two Eagle Scouts. So we got one double Hawkeye and we got sort of double Eagles here too as well tonight. So it's a great, it's a good, it's a good crowd. Um, moderating tonight's program is a professor from the College of Law, Professor Todd Pettis. Professor Pettis is the Blair and Joan White Chair in Civil Litigation at the University of Iowa College of Law. His teaching and scholarship centers around constitutional law, federal courts, and the Supreme Court and he is one of the law school's very best. He's a serious scholar, but he has some, become something of a public intellectual here in, in Iowa. He's a frequent contributor on Iowa Public Radio's River to River um, television, uh, radio show and also Talk of Iowa. And he's really become our state's go-to expert on many issues related to the First Amendment, especially in the university context. And um, I, I want to thank the Regents for supporting this program, but I also want to thank the Regents for keeping um, Todd Pettis busy because he's been a frequent um, um, guide for the Regents on important issues related to the First Amendment. Um, we have about 3,000 faculty at the University of Iowa and there's probably another 3,000 together if you add ISU and UNI that the regents have, and I, I don't know that any of them have um, briefed the Board of Regents as often as Todd Pettis does, so we are lucky to have him here tonight. Um, we are um, gonna turn it over to Todd Pettis, and he's, I'm gonna hand it off to him, and he's going to, um, to um, go ahead and run the program, and he's gonna begin with a little bit of a discourse on free speech and um, social media, free speech in this context. So um, please join me in welcoming Todd Pettis to the stage. I get my own little sign. You'll notice that Eagle Scout is not on the credentials, so I'm full disclosure. Uh, first, a mechanical thing before we forget, on the end of the rows, there's little slips of paper. If questions occur to you during the course of our remarks, and we've got four of us, counting myself, queued up to give remarks, and then a couple senators if they wish to join in too. So there's, you're going to have a stretch of time here where questions may occur to you. And so uh, scratch them down, and when we get to the Q&A part during our last 25 minutes, half hour or so, uh, I, I hope at least, uh, you'll lift those up and Pete or Pete's delegate will make sure that those get picked up. And uh, for folks who are watching online, Pete, am I right? There's a mechanism for them or are they mere spectators? They are mere spectators. Mere spectators. spectators. We're gonna put on a heck of a show. Yeah. yeah, full participants, albeit of the silent variety. Uh, so uh, we're gonna be talking mostly about policy uh, tonight, but of course there's uh, the law casts some shadow over the conversation we're having and so uh, 
there's no shortage of legal training among your panelists. I think, as I understand it, we all have it. Uh, but nevertheless, my role is to just describe a couple of the legal texts and the way in which they bear on the questions that we're having. There's two that I want to talk about. I want to talk about Section 230 of the, community, the uh, uh, Communications Decency Act. If you're immersed in this field, that text needs no introduction to you, but it's frequently referred to. And just so that we all start from the same uh, starting point, I want to tell you just briefly about what that statute is, how it came about, and how it functions, and how it plays into some of the controversies in this country right now. And then that will give me a segue into the First Amendment, which needs no introduction, but I want to tell you just a little bit about how the First Amendment is playing a role in some of these uh, debates. And that will give me uh, a segue to Carl Zabo. So I don't know in which order you're expecting to speak, but Carl, you'll be next. Okay? Because when I finish, as you'll see, yeah, I basically got your name written all over it. Okay. Uh, so first, a brief introduction to the uh, Communications Decency Act. It just takes five or six minutes or so. Uh, it starts with the law of defamation. People saying things about you that are not true, they're saying them to other people and it harms your reputation. So in that area of law, the law for a long time has made a distinction between publishers and distributors. Publishers are the people who say the thing, who make the statement, or people who repeat it. And the law has long treated those as identically liable and easily liable, very few defenses. Okay, so it's very easy to be held liable if you're a publisher. And so Lord Mansfield, way back when in England, said, whatever a man publishes, he publishes at his peril. Which means, even if what you don't know that what you're saying is false, even if you don't know that what you're saying is defamatory, under the legal regime, you can frequently be held liable for it anyway. So be careful what you say. On the other hand, there's distributors who are also involved in the communications industry, if you will, but they're different. And so think about our friends at Prairie Lights or some other bookstore. Think about them. Okay, there you come in and you buy a book from them. They hand you the book. You say, I'd like to give you money. Here, give me the money, I'll give you the book. They're helping to distribute that speech. So they're playing a role. Now suppose there's defamation in there. Are we gonna hold them liable in the same way? that even if they don't know that there's defamation there, they can easily be held liable? Well, the law has said for a long time, well, that can't be true, because what's a bookstore gonna sell then? You go to a newsstand or a bookstore, if they can easily be held liable for any defamation, even if they don't know there's defamation in it, how many books are they gonna sell? They're only gonna sell as many books and as many magazines as they personally have time to vet because they're going to want to be very careful about what they put out. So when you go to the bookstore, the shelves are going to be very sparse. It's going to be a little closet of a store. They're not going to be selling much. Only those things that they can vouch for. Okay? Now, how does, that all trans excuse me, how does that all translate to the online world? Well, there's two famous stories here, famous in this little part of the law, one involving CompuServe, one involving Prodigy. They both involved in litigation in New York in the 1990s. CompuServe is a platform. They put up these bulletin boards. They don't moderate at all. You want to put something up, you put something up. Okay? Well, one of the things that someone put up was allegedly defamatory. One of the millions of things posted on CompuServe, allegedly defamatory. And the victim of the defamation said, oh, I'm going to sue CompuServe. And I want to treat them as a publisher. One of those under the heading, whatever you, whatever you publish, you publish at your peril. You put this up. I don't care whether you knew it was defamatory or not. I should be able to be able to sue you. And the court in that case said, no, we're going to treat them just as a distributor. They're basically like prairie lights. They're just taking content that other people create. It gets put up. CompuServe doesn't vet it or whatever. The books come in, if you will, and it gets distributed. Okay? What kind of liability re regime do they live under? Well, like the bookstores do and distributors, they can only be held liable when they know that there's some defamation there and they're tolerating it anyway. So it can still be held liable, but it's much harder to find them liable. Okay? Now here, along comes Prodigy. And Prodigy says, you know, CompuServe, what an ugly, you know, jungle that is. All this garbage that gets put up. We're going to put up a family-friendly kind of site by comparison. We're going to have community standards. We're going to have this, these algorithms that scan our content to take down stuff that we regard as objectionable. We're going to have some human monitors who are looking to see what's being put up. And if we see something that's problematic, we're going to take it down. All right? Well, defamation comes along and someone says, I want to sue Prodigy because Prodigy left up something that was defamatory about me. 
And the court held in that case, and this is what gets the whole Communications Decency Act rolling, at least for Section 230, on this telling of the story anyway, the court says, well, because they were vetting the material, they were deciding what to put up, oh, we're going to keep this off, we're going to let the rest of this go, they're basically acting like publishers. They're deciding what to say. And so they can be held liable even if they don't know that there's defamation up on their site. Like the Lord Mansfield rule, whatever you publish, you publish at your peril. Okay, so now look at the choice that you, if you're running one of these online platforms, here are your two choices. Don't do any vetting at all. Whatever garbage people want to put up, leave it up. That's the safest way to avoid liability for defamation. You're going to go through and vet and try to keep the garbage off your site. Well, now you're in the vetting business. You're deciding what to put up. So you're basically a publisher. You're basically a speaker, and it's going to be easier to hold you liable. So which of those are you going to do? Well, if you're worried about defamation, you're going to say, we're not going to do any vetting at all. Now, Congress is watching this, and Congress says, you know, there's a lot of porn, there's a lot of ugliness, there's a lot of violence, and we, you know, we'd kind of like there to be some self-regulation. We would like these platforms to regulate their own content so the government doesn't have to do it for them, but now look at these legal incentives. They're not going to self-regulate because they're digging themselves a hole when there's defamation put up on their website. And so what Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act does is it says that these websites, interactive computer services, if you will, what these you're running one of these websites or platforms or something, you cannot be treated as a speaker if it's content put up by somebody else. And it kind of doubles down on that and says, if you are in good faith going through trying to remove stuff that you regard as objectionable, you can't be held liable on that basis. So the, the statute doesn't require these platforms to monitor their content, but what it does is try to knock down this big legal incentive not to regulate so that they can, can indeed regulate and not face legal liability as a result. And so the Twitters, the Facebooks, and so forth commonly do regulate, do regulate. So what you see is curated. They've got algorithms and so forth that decide what are you going to see when you log on and when you post, who's going to see it? You don't have full control over that. They're out. They'll decide how it goes out. So they're doing a, an awful lot of vetting. They'll have their, they can have rules. You violate their rules and they, they want to kick you off and ban you from the platform or something. Say, we can do that. All right. So then here we have controversy then, right? Because people who are being kicked off say, who are you kicking off? Looks like it's predominantly conservative voices. There's a con an anti-conservative bias here. That's really warping political discourse given the fact that billions of people are using these now for communication. And then you have other critics saying, why aren't you kicking more people off? You've got foreign, alleged foreign interference in elections and these deep fake videos and so forth. Why aren't you vetting those things? And so that puts Section 230 really in the crosshairs and a lot of controversy about what to do. Okay? Now, I say the statute doesn't require these platforms to regulate. It doesn't, but that doesn't mean necessarily that Congress or state legislatures might enact laws to try to force them to regulate in particular ways, stop kicking people off or whatever it is that lawmakers want them to do. And that brings us to the, the First Amendment, which will just take just a couple minutes here and then I'm done. The First Amendment comes up then in these conversations in a couple ways. First, those whose views who are, are, are being silenced or speakers who are being deplatformed, re, you know, you know, removed from the sites, removed from access to the sites, naturally have an impulse to say, I have a First Amendment right to speak. This is a violation of my free speech right that you're denying me access to this platform. And the problem with that, and it perhaps is not an insurmountable problem, but it is an enormous problem, is it's not the government that's kicking them off. These are privately owned companies. And the free speech clause, like all the rest of the stuff in the Bill of Rights, is not there to control what you all do in your private capacities or in the private businesses that you run. What it is meant to do is to control Senator Walls and Senator Sinclair and other elected officials when they're acting in a governmental capacity. Okay? This is there to constrain government. So if government is saying, we're kicking you off, well, now we have a free speech problem. But if a privately owned company that it just so happens a lot of people have bought into says, we don't want you here on our private property anymore, it's not at all clear that the, free, the, free, that the speech clause even speaks to that. There's some academic arguments out there that, oh, maybe we, they're, maybe we should treat them as if they're the government. But those arguments face a steep uphill climb. And so probably 
I'll just say probably, the First Amendment does not compel these private companies to provide access to anybody. That's controversial in some circles, but that's sure where the greater weight of authority probably lies right now until courts say something differently. So along come state legislatures, and here's the last piece of what I want to say. A number of states are, con and in Congress there's conversations about this too, but I'll focus on states because that's where a lot of the activity has been. States consider, well, maybe we can pass laws aimed at providing strong incentives to these enormous social media companies, telling them that if they kick people off or do one thing or another that we find objectionable, we're going to make life harder. We'll take away tax breaks. We we'll, won't allow them to enter into government contracts. We'll, you know, we'll do different things. And so here in Iowa, we've had both in both chambers of the legislature, they haven't passed through to law, but in our last session, conversation about this. These massive social media companies, should we in fact take action like that if they, and there are different versions of the bills, for example, if they deny access to an elected official, should there be consequences? If they use their algorithms in, a, in particular ways, if they don't give you the right to opt out of some of those algorithms, should we impose consequences? Well. Florida went down that road and did actually enact that legislation and Carl Zabo's uh, organization Net Choice filed a lawsuit and won and that statute in Florida was declared in Florida to be a violation of the First Amendment. So here's the First Amendment showing itself in a different way. I said the First Amendment doesn't give people probably a right to access those platforms but it might well give those platforms a First Amendment right of their own to control the speech that they promote on their own platforms. So it's the First Amendment just kind of spun around from the different direction, looking now not at the private speaker trying to access, but the platforms themselves, the social media companies themselves, asserting a First Amendment free speech right. And in Florida, the court held that we, we've got a problem and struck down the Florida statute. In Texas, much more recently, in early September, Texas passed a law saying, uh, as I recall, and Carl, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, if, if social media companies, is it using algorithms in a particular way? Is it an algorithms, okay, part of it? So if they don't if, give you a, a right to, if they don't give you the ability to opt out of having those algorithms applied to you, there's gonna be consequences uh, imposed, all right? Eight hours ago, is it? Okay, eight hours ago, Carl's organization filed a lawsuit against that statute too. And so we'll see how that goes. And so that's a good segue, as I promised, to our next speaker, Carl Zabo. Okay, good evening. Uh, and, and Todd, that was actually a fantastic description of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Uh, the, you know, one, one of the things in my job that I have the privilege of doing uh, at, at NetChoice is actually former Congressman Chris Cox sits on the board of my trade association. He's one of the authors of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And, and as Todd described it, it's pretty much spot on. He was flying back from California to D.C. because he was a Republican uh, lawmaker out of uh, Orange County. And he opens up the Wall Street Journal and he sees this decision that Todd described against Prodigy. Here's Prodigy trying to clean up the internet and they get slapped for it. And he thought, there's something wrong about that. And as a society, when you try to do the right thing, we try to encourage that as a society. Every state in the country has what is called the Good Samaritan Law. If I'm leaving this discussion and I see somebody on the ground struggling and I perform CPR on them, and in doing so, I happen to break their ribs. We as a society say that person shouldn't be able to sue me for breaking their ribs when I'm trying to save their life. Well, that's what Section 230 is for the internet. The two, two components of it, one, C1, is relatively simple, and it's actually pretty non-controversial. It's what the courts have said for years, what Todd outlined when it comes to bookstores. It is what is called conduit immunity. If you are basically a pass-through of content, you assume no liability. And we need only look at our own televisions to realize that being true. Uh, for many of the law students, they might ha have even been alive for the Janet Jackson wardrobe malfunction. But the suits went against 
the broadcasters, the platform that showed it, not the cable companies who carried it through their pipes. Same thing's true with defamation. If something defaming happens on AMC, the person would sue AMC, not Comcast. So that's called conduit immunity. And that's basically what the CompuServe case held, was if you do nothing, you're a conduit, conduit immunity. And that's what C1 of, the section two, of Section 230 says. If you are a conduit, you assume no liability. So basically, it enshrined into law what was court-created doctrine, and we all saw that. But then you get into this catch-22, this problem for the Good Samaritans who want to go and clean up the internet. We know what the internet looks like unfettered. It's called 8chan. It's called 4chan. It's called the internet back before people were really on it. And so what the Good Samaritan complex or component in C2 really did, that's the really novel part of Section 230, is it enshrined into law the Good Samaritan provision. If you go out and try to do the right thing, if you engage in the removal of lewd, lascivious, or otherwise objectionable content as a subjective standard, if you remove content that you find offensive for your users or your advertisers, we're not going to punish you. We're not going to punish you for removing that content, and we are not going to hold you liable for any content that you either missed or chose not to remove. So if you go and try to do the good thing, we're going to encourage that. And that's kind of what Section 230 did. And it often comes up in these discussions of free speech and social media. Uh, it, it's one of the most misunderstood laws out there. And you should not be surprised that you may interpret it one way or, the, or another and it may not be the correct way. In fact, the New York Times has had to publish two corrections when referring to Section 230. A couple, several months ago, they took out a full page business section, it was the full page, B1, and it was entitled, The Law That Empowers Hate Speech on the Internet, Section 230. And the next day, in a very small print, they published a correction, which reads, oh, it turns out it's not Section 230 that empowers hate speech on the Internet, it's the First Amendment. <laughs> they, they didn't quite seem to learn their lesson, uh, amazingly, a couple months ago, in fact, they published a similar article, except instead of saying it's the law that empowers hate speech on the internet, it is now the law that empowers content moderation on the internet, section 230. And then, likewise, like the similar story, the next day they published a very small font correction. Turns out it's not section 230 that empowers content moderation on the internet, it's the First Amendment. And, and what is the First Amendment? The First Amendment is not designed to protect you, me, or anyone in this room from Facebook. It's not designed to protect me from Twitter. It's not even designed to protect me from which witch deciding not to make me a sandwich. No, the First Amendment is designed to protect me from the government. That is what we are all truly afraid of because as much as we like to call it Facebook jail, Mark Zuckerberg cannot lock you up. The government can, and that's why the First Amendment is a limitation on government power and it's intentionally structured that way and it's supposed to be hard for the government to violate that because we don't want them to violate those rules. Now, that kind of uh, turns us into the discussions that I have with regard to the First Amendment and the lawsuits that we've seen going on. So, as was noted earlier, not only am I an Eagle Scout, I, I also know you didn't mention I was a cheerleader at Rice, which he asked me another fun fact. Um, but my my Trade Association has brought two suits against states that have enacted these laws. But for me, I'm a conservative. And, and uh, you know, I'm very much into limited government, free markets, free enterprise. Uh, I, I'm an originalist, uh, which is really nice since I teach at the Antonin Scalia Law School. That certainly helps. Not all my students feel that way, but, you know, I, I teach a good class, I like to think. And when I come forth on these issues, and I see Twitter removing content, when I see Twitter removing Mike for, for content he, he posts, does it, does it make me angry, when, especially when it's a viewpoint-based removal? Does it upset me? Yeah, yeah, it frustrates me. It makes me angry. It makes me go, ah, I, I, I want to rage. But then, you know, kind of the, the non-lizard side of my brain, the rational side of my brain jump, jumps in, the originalist side, the conservative side says, well, what's the solution? Is it more government? Is it government coming in and telling a private business how to run its own system? No, it's not. 
And much as I mentioned Witch Witch, uh, wonderful sandwich shop, which I missed from DC, uh, I was happy to see it here. If I were to go into Witch Witch and flip over a table, it would be perfectly reasonable for the store manager to come out from behind the counter and say, sir, you need to leave. Okay, that makes sense. If I were to go in with a really offensive t-shirt, it would be perfectly reasonable for that store manager to come out from behind the counter and say, sir, you need to leave. Same thing would be true if I went to Disney World or pretty much anywhere else that's a private business. We respect the rights of private businesses to decide what's best for their users and their, their customers and their advertisers. That's the basis for conservative decisions like Masterpiece Cakes. That's the basis for decisions like Hobby Lobby. That's the basis for decisions like Citizens United. It's that private business can decide what's best for private business. Now, why do we see all this content moderation? Why, why is this happening? Why are we even here talking about free speech and social media? Why do they engage in this content moderation? Why don't they just let everything, everything show up? Everything allowed under, under the First Amendment. The First Amendment allows a heck of a lot and a lot of really bad stuff that we don't necessarily think about because it's not shoved into our face every single day. There's the obvious ones of hate speech, right? Hate speech. There's uh, just people being mean to each other. Maybe we don't want them to be mean to each other. But there are other things like, well, nudity is allowed under the First Amendment. Obscenity is not, but nudity is. And figuring out that line, especially on scale, is really, really hard. What's another thing that's allowed? Child grooming. Child grooming is constitutionally protected speech. That's where somebody who's old tries to cultivate a relationship with a minor. Perfectly legal. When they act on it, it's, it becomes illegal. Uh, what, what, what other type of content is allowed? Uh, well, you've got, as, as the, the head of the school mentioned, you have disinformation. Well, maybe I want a platform. Maybe I'm running a, an encyclopedia-style system. Maybe I'm running a, a Wikipedia-style system. I want accurate, reliable information, and I don't want controversial or false, patently false information. Can't, can't stop that with the First Amendment. What if I want to harass or bully people? Can't stop that under the First Amendment. We have a huge bullying problem going on right now, teen shaming. So there's lots of content moderation going on, and why do the platforms do it? Because they want you to be on their platforms. If I went on to Facebook and I saw a bunch of really crass, awful speech, I might leave. And believe you me, it could be much worse than it is right now. Terrorist recruitment, First Amendment protected, probably stuff we don't want to see. So that's why the content moderation goes on. But you know, as a conservative, I sometimes see, oh my gosh, they, they took this person down. A, a recent example was, Clarence Thomas, who, who I really respect a lot, uh, had a documentary removed from Amazon Prime Video. And it went all around the conservative sphere. And we're, and we're all thinking, oh, this is Amazon Prime, this is Jeff Bezos stepping on conservative speech. Well, it turns out, because when I saw this, I got really angry and I contacted my colleagues over at Amazon. I was like, what's going on? Well, it turns out it had absolutely nothing to do with Clarence Thomas, had absolutely nothing to do with his documentary. In fact, Amazon Video obliterated the entire category of short-form documentaries. Uh, about 10,000 videos disappeared overnight because it turns out nobody was watching them, nobody was really using them, they didn't feel like paying for the licenses. Clarence Thomas happened to be one of 10,000 videos that went down. But a lot of people see that as a target at them, at their speech. So sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes it is a viewpoint discrimination, which them as a private business can do. Now, I will give you some stats on why conservatives are not being moderated online, but as my wife, who's a child therapist, tells me, you can't dispel feelings. So just some fun stats. Um, so YouTube restricted mode. So YouTube has a feature, and it's great for me as a parent. YouTube has a feature called restricted mode. It basically says there are two categories of videos. There's almost, you know, there's a lot, and then there's stuff that we deem to be essentially you might not want to see. Consider it like a safe search mode. And for me as a parent, I really appreciate that because it helps me know that my kids aren't going to see certain content. So things that end up in restricted mode. Uh, the Young Turks, 71% of their videos end up in restricted mode. Young Turks is a far left uh, video service. So 71% of their videos on YouTube end up in restricted mode. The Daily Show, 54%. 
Democracy Now! also left, 48%. History Channel, 24% of their videos end up in restricted mode. And that makes sense because some like Holocaust, you know, I'm Jewish, I want to talk to my kids about that rather than have them stumble upon it. Prager U, who is one of the leading complainers about quote unquote censorship or restricted modes on YouTube, only 12%. So while they're 12%, their compatriots on the left are 70, 71%. But sometimes we only live in our echo chambers. We only hear what's going on. Um, so they also engage in content moderation because that's what we want. So one of the things the uh, Texas bill, which we just brought suit against, prohibits is essentially prioritizing content based on viewpoints. That makes sense. You don't want to discriminate, quote unquote, based on a viewpoint. Well, my viewpoint is that you want a, you know, I do a search for sandwiches and I get the result for which which. I'm gonna just continuously pick on them. Uh, I, I don't get a result for Panera, which is closed. Well there, Google has just done a discriminatory viewpoint-based result. The viewpoint-based, the viewpoint is, I wanna sell you sandwiches and I'm open. The other is viewpoint and I'm closed and they have downranked Panera. Well, if I'm Panera and I've been downranked, I'm gonna be upset about that. The same thing's true if I'm doing a search for information on a political issue, an apolitical issue, or similar. So one of the things that we found when it comes to search, for example, is you had to figure out how to modify it in ways to give people the results they want. So one of the things that Google discovered very early on in their search, and this is an amazing documentary on this, so uh, they would do moon landing faked. And most every single result originally would be videos of how the moon landing's been faked. Websites on how the moon landing's been faked because the only people talking about the faking of the moon landing are people who think it was faked. And Google decided maybe we don't want this to be the, the, the top search result that people get. So they adjusted the algorithm and they, they uh, gave you now a, a, an information box at the top to say, Here's some other websites you might want to check out. Same thing's true with Holocaust denial. Most of the websites talking about Holocaust denial were, or a search of did the Holocaust happen, would be Holocaust denials come up. So there's lots of content moderation going on all the time. Uh, in just six months, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter removed 12 million accounts for extremism and terrorist content. Uh, Two billion for fake accounts, three billion of bots and spam, 17 million for child safety, and 57 million for nudity and pornography. Okay, so we've established that uh, some people think Section 230 is the problem, but the courts have said otherwise. The court down in Florida, in their 39-page decision, uh, finding that finding for net choice and CCIA against the state of Florida, one page was about 230. The rest was about the First Amendment, and that's really what this is all about. When it comes to Section 230, Section 230 at the end of the day is really a litigation tool. It's kind of the bane of plaintiff's attorneys because what it does is it allows me to terminate a trial paying only 50K as opposed to going all the way through discovery and paying a million dollars to get to the point where we discover that, oh, it's the First Amendment that allows me to engage in content moderation or from a conservative viewpoint, when you sign up on these services, you enter into a terms of service and privacy policy. It's a two-party contract. You agree to host the content, pay for the servers, the engineers, everything else. I agree to abide by your community standards. And in these cases, people breach that contract and expect YouTube, Facebook, Google, Parler, Rumble, MeWe, Snapchat to not uphold breach of contract. So what does Section 230 do? It allows me to dismiss the trial of what's called a 12B6 motion to dismiss for all you law students out there. It's the most important uh, uh, motion you need to know, as opposed to spending a million dollars and getting the same conclusion. Okay, the First Amendment. So the For Florida court uh, in its decision said, like prior First Amendment restrictions, this is an instance of burning the house to roast a pig in the case of Florida. So we have two instances of states trying to regulate content in social media that have passed laws, enacted laws, Florida and Texas. So we'll go with Florida because you already reached a, de a decision on it. Texas, we expect to have a decision pretty soon, which is basically going to be Florida, except now in a Texas court. And in both cases, the states came out and said, you may not engage in content-based 
restrictions or removal of content from certain groups. Uh, it's a little different in both. We'll stick to Florida for now because text is slightly different flavor. So in Florida, they basically told platforms, you may not remove content from what we deem to be a journalistic enterprise. Journalistic enterprise was so broadly defined that Kim Kardashian would be a journalistic enterprise. So we could not content moderate Kim Kardashian, which probably you should. <laughs> so that's basically telling a platform, telling a private business, you can't remove content that you find objectionable. And the pro there's probably a good bit of stuff out there on Kim Kardashian that is objectionable. And if you're running a like, family-friendly site, you don't want. So that was one thing that Florida did that uh, was problematic. Another thing they did was say, okay, you can't affix content to posts or tweets. So the classic example would be Twitter flagging a statement by President Trump, this uh, is false or this is not true or something like that. That's basically a government prohibiting speech. I mean, it's a clear cut violation of the First Amendment. The judge, of course, found that to be unconstitutional. Side note, Section 230 would not have protected Twitter in that case anyways. Section 230 says, if you are responsible in whole or in part for the creation or development of the content, such as saying this is false, Twitter saying this is false, 230 provides no bar. So when it comes to the First Amendment, it's clear that the states cannot tell a private business that they can or cannot what to say and what not to say. That's why the First Amendment's written that way it is. So what you've seen is a shift to try and do an end run around the First Amendment. And there are a lot of really clever attorneys out there, very smart attorneys, very top tier attorneys, and they are turning themselves into pretzels to try and get around the First Amendment. And you know what? It should be hard to get around the First Amendment. One is that they are a monopoly. This is, this is one of my favorites. You are a monopoly and thus not entitled to the First Amendment. Well. This actually came up in PragerU's suit of YouTube. And the judge in that decision, who's a Federalist Society judge, by the way, uh, said, despite YouTube's ubiquity and its role as a public-facing platform, it, maintains, it remains a private platform, not a uh, public forum subject to judicial scrutiny under the First Amendment. OK, that's legalese for basically saying, even if, we, even if you were a monopoly, you still get First Amendment protections. Let's go a step further. Miami Herald versus Tornillo. OK, I got one minute. Let me speed through this. Miami Herald versus Tornillo. This Supreme Court decision, unanimous decision. Uh, Miami Herald was basically the monopoly newspaper there. Supreme Court said, well, you may be a monopoly, but you're still entitled to First Amendment protection. And the state cannot force you to host speech from a politician or anyone else because you're entitled to First Amendment protections. Another is that you're a common carrier. Justice Thomas raised this as a, pos as a thought experiment. He said they might be closer to UP USPS than anything else, but of course, neither UPS nor FedEx are common carriers, so I don't really see how YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter are closer to USPS than them. Um, and there's a whole litany of that. Even if they were common carriers, there's a Supreme Court decision on that. It involves PG&E which said that even if you're a common carrier, which they most definitely are because they're a public utility, they're still entitled to First Amendment protections and they didn't have to put content in their envelopes that they didn't want. And then finally is public forum, and then I will close, I promise. Public forum is the latest argument, oh, you're the new public forum. Well, this amendment was introduced and rejected in Texas, it was discussed in Florida. If we want to create the new public forum that gives full First Amendment protections, that's the goal of lawmakers. What they should not do is try and nationalize a private business. Instead, they can create their own public forum. In Texas, it was uh, proposed as an amendment that instead you should create publicforum.texas.gov. You would have open access, the government could create it, and it would be entitled to the First Amendment protection. So if that's what we truly want, let's go back to what the public forum is, as Clarence Thomas defined it, has been defined historically. It's something created by the government for the people. And with that, I will take the hook, and we'll turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Mike, as I follow the thread of the conversation, you said a four-time veteran of Twitter jail. I think this conversation leads now to you. Twit bump.
so thank you to the university president, Barb Wilson, uh, the regent, David Barker, law school dean, Kevin Washburn, law professor, uh, Todd Pettis, um, uh, Dr. Pete Damiano, and the rest of the great team here at the University of Iowa for hosting this event and for the warm, wel warm welcome. Uh, thank you to my panelists, Carl Zabo, uh, Tracy Griffith, who I think is on Zoom, uh, for joining the discussion. Uh, great job, Carl, explaining uh, 2.30 and making your uh, very persuasive arguments. And thank you to the two Iowa State Senators, uh, Amy Sinclair and Zach Walls, for agreeing to do the follow-up after our discussion. I am a proud Iowa and Iowa law grad. And as someone who was very vocal, uh, some would say obnoxious, uh, on this campus as a Republican student organizer for the uh, 2000, 2002, and 2004 election cycles, um, I very much appreciate it and need it, the First Amendment protections. Um, and it was Professor Tim Hagel in the Political Science Department, uh, who was my faculty advisor, mentor, and friend, who saved my neck too many times to count. And he, uh, Professor Hagel is truly a champion for free speech on this campus, and in, uh, regardless of the political leanings of the students. He was always a champion for the students. Um, and he won't admit this now, uh, but my friend and classmate, Peter Mathis, uh, who uh, is a top aide to the university president, was very much a co-conspirator uh, in my enterprise. And so he was just smart enough not to get caught. Um, I want to thank, in particular, Dean Washburn for inviting me to join today's discussion. Uh, Dean Washburn is a great ambassador for the University of Iowa uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, where he works very effectively to secure key clerkships and jobs for his law students, regardless of their uh, politics. Kyle Apple is one of those beneficiaries. He's uh, now a second-year law student. He was able to uh, serve as a law clerk on uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee for our home state senator, Chuck Grassley, my former boss. Uh, and it was Dean Washburn who was the one who was instrumental in making that happen. So thank you for all that you do there. Um, what's in, what Dean Washburn does at the law school is very important. He understands that we have different political viewpoints, but it is uh, critical that all, all sides can speak and be heard. And I think that's very important. Um, uh, understanding and appreciating our differences helps bring us together, and it, uh, we all benefit from that. That is why censorship and cancel culture is so troubling to me. Um, when you marginalize, you radicalize. And so I started two national organizations, two national uh, advocacy organizations. One is called the Internet Accountability Project, and the other is called Unsilenced Majority that combats both censorship and cancel culture. And I would say that today's biggest proponents, enablers, and enforcers of censorship and cancel, cancel culture are the, uh, the trillion dollar big tech monopolists. And those are Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, um, along with their, I call them the little brother Twitter. Uh, tw Twitter's not really a significant uh, market player, but they, the Twitter's the one that always gets the other ones in trouble. So because of their antitrust amnesty and their section 230 immunity, big tech monopolists have uh, way too much power over our lives, and they have an unholy alliance with get big government, and uh, they, they use their power to censor, silence, deplatform, even cancel those with whom they disagree. Um, and when you're dealing with a monopolist, there's only one neck for the government to choke, so it's very easy for the government to control monopolists. We just saw smoking gun evidence of this when the White House press secretary nonchalantly announced that the government is working with Facebook to censor COVID, quote, misinformation. As, as if COVID science doesn't evolve as we learn new facts. Um, as if Tony Fauci is some infallible COVID god. As if Jen Psaki runs the Ministry of Truth. And big tech, ever eager to keep the regime happy, takes its censorship marching orders. When they censor under the guise of protecting us from, quote, misinformation, they're either uh, obliviously or maliciously arrogant about their appropriate role in a free society. The United States isn't China yet. Let's talk more about some of big tech's most egregious examples of political censorship. And I, this may not make this crowd very happy, but um, 
let's talk about Hillary Clinton uh, back in the uh, 2016 election. She still falsely claims that Donald Trump colluded with Russians to steal the 2016 presidential election. Yet big tech deplatformed President Trump as a sitting president for claiming that the 2020 election was stolen. And before the election in 2020, big tech censored the New York Post, our nation's oldest continuous newspaper for publishing negative stories on Joe Biden's potential foreign corruption following the discovery of Hunter Biden's infamous laptop. How did big tech justify this brazen political censorship? They claimed that the emails were fake and that this was a, a Russian dis disinformation campaign, uh, both of which we now know are, are not true. Uh, big tech has been particularly egregious with its COVID censorship. They're censoring noted doctors, scientists, and even a sitting United States senator who also happens to be a medical doctor. Even if one is ignorant or arrogant enough to believe that they are the ultimate arbiter of truth, how does censoring dissenting doctors and scientists help convince vaccine-hesitant Americans, and those are disproportionately black and Hispanic Americans, overcome their concerns and get, and get vaccinated? Uh, censorship is counterproductive, even deadly. It politicizes the scientific debate. It makes people lose confidence in the science, particularly the science behind co uh, vaccines, COVID vaccines. COVID vaccines are even more effective than advertised, especially as it relates to hospitalizations and deaths. But many people don't believe this. One of the reasons is that censorship has created mistrust. Why, we, uh, we don't need Tony Fauci, Jen Psaki, and their censors at Facebook to protect us from ourselves. Get the information out there, good or bad, right or wrong, and let people make their own informed decisions. In, cons in consultation with their own medical providers. How did we get here and how do we move past this? Carl did a, a very good job, as did Professor Pettis, of, of talking about Section 230, so I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. During the Internet's infancy, Congress uh, passed Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. The purpose of Section 230 was to promote free speech online by shielding the inter Internet providers from defamation lawsuits based upon what their users post. So if I dialed up America Online in 1997 and posted that I saw, again, I'll pick on Peter, Peter Mathis passed out on the Ped Mall on Tuesday afternoon, Peter could sue me for defamation, uh, unless, of course, I was telling the truth. But under Section 230, Peter could not sue America Online for defamation, uh, like Peter could sue other, I don't know if we want to call it publishers or distributors of the, of the, of the defamation. We didn't want AOL to get into the business of serving as the speech police. Section 230 made a lot of sense at the time. We wanted to promote the internet economy and free speech generally, and this required protecting the internet infants from defamation lawsuits, oftentimes driven by the big publishers that would have wiped these internet startups off the map. Fast forward 25 years, and the public square is now largely online. People more frequently exchange ideas and political jabs on platforms like Facebook and Twitter than they do on the Ped Mall or the Tian Cleary walkway. And there's been a changing of the online guard. And they're increasingly much more powerful and much less concerned about free speech. And indeed, we've replaced the internet infants of 1996, AOL, CopyServe, and Prodigy with today's trillion dollar big tech monopolists. Through a bad combination of Section 230 immunity from 1996 and antitrust amnesty over the last decade, these big tech platforms have amassed too much power and control over our lives. And they are using Section 230 as a censorship sword instead of as the intended free speech shield. There are, there are no real competitors to big tech as it relates to online speech. Google owns YouTube, Facebook owns Instagram and WhatsApp. If these platforms actually had to compete for their users, including for the user's very valuable online time and data, it's much less likely the platforms would mistreat the users, including censoring them. If these users actually had platform options, it's much less likely that the users 
would remain on a platform that mistreats them, uh, including, censoring, in, including censoring them. A good example of this is Parler, a startup competitor to Twitter. Conservatives angry with Twitter's censorship of President Trump and other conservatives uh, began to join Twitter, or excuse me, began to join Parler in a mass exodus from Twitter. Parler quickly attained a valuation of $1.3 billion. So instead of trying to woo back these conservative users from a new competitor by changing their censorship policies, Twitter simply killed the competition. Indeed, Parler got blamed for the January 6th Capitol protest, even though the FBI's evidence is clear that the protesters largely organized on Facebook. Then Google and Apple kicked Parler out of the, the App Store duopoly, and Amazon kicked Parler off the internet. Twitter continues its censorship business as usual. So why do we ignore the Sherman Act, our century-old antitrust law, for, a, uh, for over a decade and allow big tech to become trillion dollar monopolists? Why do we allow these uh, trillion dollar monopolists to use section 230 to stifle instead of promote free speech? Why did we create these online monsters? And how do we fix this? Uh, we must do two important things. Uh, number one, we must end big tech's antitrust amnesty. And our federal and state law enforcers must enforce our century old antitrust laws. We cannot continue to allow trillion dollar big tech monopolists to kill competitors like Parler, control the online public square, and censor our thoughts. We must break up big tech. The good news is that the House Judiciary Committee recently passed six bipartisan bills to rein in big tech. These bills are championed by David Cicilline, a liberal Democrat Trump impeachment manager from Rhode Island, and Ken Buck, a conservative Republican from Colorado. Senator Chuck Grassley, who I said was my former boss, our senior senator and the top Republican on the Senate Judiciary Committee is working across the aisle with Senator Amy Klobuchar, uh, the Senate Antitrust Subcommittee Chair, on a bipartisan compromise to get these much needed big tech reforms enacted into law this Congress. And there's a very good chance that this will happen. We should all support these bipartisan efforts. Number two, we must reform or repeal Section Big, big Tech Section 230 immunity, so they can no longer censor, silence, deplatform, and even cancel those with whom they disagree. This leads to government-sponsored censorship, and Jen Psaki made it clear that the government is acti actively working with Facebook to censor Americans. We need more competition, not less. We need more free speech, not less. And thank you for hearing me out, and I'm happy to answer your questions at the appropriate time. Now, I believe through the magic of technology, we're going to have Professor Griffith. Yes? Yes, we should. Okay. There she is. And there she is. Professor Griffith, can you hear us okay? I can. Yes. Can you hear me? Perfectly. The floor is yours. Excellent. First, thank you so much for the invitation to speak tonight. Such, such an important issue. I, I am going to take the uh, conversation in a little bit of a different direction, right? Um, you know, I, Yes, I am a lawyer, but I am also a former journalist and currently am a uh, professor of communications. And so I'm, you know, the idea that social media exists um, in this vacuum is, is something that, that I, I kind of want to dispel. And I want to talk a little bit about the people behind social media, right? Yes, there are corporations that are, you know, that are conducting cancel, that are driving cancel culture, et cetera. But there are people, there are actual users behind this. And what is the, what is the idea when someone logs on and tweets something, um, what, what's, what's in their mind? What, how does it fuel the current situation that we find ourselves in? And so I think the first thing that we really need to think about is we are in this place where currently we have an enormous lack of trust and that's the primary issue that uh, modern institutions are facing, right? Um, trust among an institution's publics, it, it's the mo single most important factor in whether or not that institution will survive and whether that institution will thrive, right? And so with, with 
a decline in trust, we're finding that um, social media, right, is playing this role in our society that is largely being perceived as negative. Understanding that social media at this point is one of the institutions, media is one of the institutions, trust is, is, an, is at an all-time low, right? Um, and looking at the four areas or four institutions, government, NGOs, media, and business, all-time low in terms of trust, public trust. And without that trust, we find ourselves in this situation. Um, the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is a um, which is a survey done by Edelman Worldwide, a public relations major public relations firm, shows us that in 2016, all four of the institutions were on a high. Right, they were the trust factor on those institutions were at, were at the highest level since the recession in 2008. Okay, this was five years ago that I'm talking about, all time high. 20, by 2018, the trust in the four institutions, not just eroded, but it imploded. Okay, we're looking at numbers that say, you know, overall trust plummeted by 23 points in those four, in those four organizations. And we have to question as to why that is, right? Normally, public trust erodes after some major event within the society. Post 9-11, right? Trust was eroding. Um, and now we find ourselves, you know, in the midst of COVID. And that could be one of the reasons why so many organizations or so many institutions are suffering from a lack of public trust. Uh, but social media has a big, big impact on that. Um, let, let's think in terms of a timeline here. So um, if we look back maybe, you know, 15 years ago uh, or so, 2002, let's look at 2002. Um, Non-governmental organizations in terms of public trust are on the same level um, with businesses and government, right? Um, although the business sector did see a bit of a hit post 9-11, okay? 2004, um, although trust in business and government increased globally, uh, major US companies in Europe and Asia suffered from a loss of trust. But European and Asian companies in the US flourished. Okay, that's 2004. Let's look at 2006. 2006 is very interesting because according to Edelman, 2006 saw this birth of this person like me, right? The average Joe. Um, if you remember Joe the plumber, right? Pers a person like me becomes the most credible spokesperson in the minds of the US public, right? And in the top three globally, person like me, right? So there's, there's, we're, we're seeing this kind of disdain for the experts, those who speak on issues, and we begin to learn to trust people like us, right? The us versus them a lot more, according to the Edelman survey. 2008, we see an upsurge in young influencers, right? Social media, of course, plays a lot into this. So young influencers are putting, are out there more. They are seeing this surge in people trusting them to provide us with information, okay? Um, I love the comment on the speaker before about Kim Kardashian. Yeah, okay, I'm a little, yeah, I'm with you on that. I'm not sure I'm totally willing to listen to Kim Kardashian on, on life issues, but okay. You know, the survey reveals that a lot of the younger influencers are doing just that. They're influencing the way, the direction our society is going, okay? Um, 
Okay. Uh, 2010. Trust is now an essential line of those institutions. Trust and, and transparency, transparency, right, becomes vital in each of those four areas. Trust and transparency. 2012, a lot of countries find themselves plagued with financial crises, right? So trust in government is rapidly declining. That's in 2012. 2014, business, businesses are slowly make, climbing their way up, taking the trust advantage over government in the majority of markets. Um, NGOs are still in 2014, the most trusted of those four institutions. Not government, right? Not business, not media, NGOs. 2016, interesting year. Keep in mind, 2016, growing inequality of trust. Trust in all areas at this point, 2018, 2016, is at the highest since the Great Recession, right? And business is receiving its largest increase in trust. A growing trust disparity puts business in a new situation of strength as it's moving forward. And then we get to 2018. And, uh, you know, I'll leave it up to you to, you know, decipher what happens in 2018, but the battle for truth begins. Trust in the US suffered the largest ever drop driven by a staggering lack of faith in government. Trust among the informed public was the lowest of the 28 markets that are, sur that are surveyed in, in this survey. Trust among the informed public was at the lowest of the 28 markets, below Russia and below South Africa. So it, it's important to note, right, that sadly, and maybe this is, this is where social media comes into it, right? Media is the least trusted institution worldwide according to Edelman survey, worldwide media, right? And so a lot of it is built upon the mistrust of two words, fake news, right? And, and its impact on our society. And Pew Research studies indicate that, you know, the people who really have a negative view of the impact of media and social media in particular, they cite misinformation, they cite um, hate and harassment and you know, all of these negative aspects of social media as the reason why they just don't trust media, right? Social media's role in, in creating partisanship, polarization, um, you know, the creation of echo chambers, these are all things that they identify as reasons why they don't trust the media and social media in particular. Now, younger adults, we're talking like the 18 to 29 year olds, you know, we, we, we view that, we know and understand that they utilize media technology very differently than the old guys, the rest of us. And, you know, they say that social media has a positive impact. They think that social media has a positive impact on the way that things are happening and, or do, and working within our country. Um, and they're less likely to believe that social media is at fault in all of this. And so those 18 to 29 year olds say that social media is a positive thing. And the, for the, of those of that group that do view it in some ways negatively, um, it's a very small percentage. Right. Many of them say that, um, you know, people who actually use social media say that, you know, 
the negative impact on social media is very slight, right? As compared to people who don't use it, who say that it's more negative. So those who use it say it's less negative. Those who don't use it say it's more negative. So it may be more of a per perception. Um, past Pew Research studies show that there is this really complicated relationship that Americans have with social media. And, but at the heart of it is that issue of trust, right? Um, last year, a Pew Center survey basically found that 72% of US adults use at least one social media site, right? With, uh, with strong numbers using multiple social media sites. And they, there are many who object to the way that, that social media is being used in this day and age. Many of them say that um, it's been weaponized, right, in our society. It's been weaponized to spread uh, made up news, um, to, to further online harassment. Um, but that's at the same time, interestingly enough, a share, of the, a share of those media, social media users admit that social media has been beneficial in helping them to change their minds on uh, social and political issues, right? And so we recognize that social media is playing this huge role on what we think and believe and, and on our behavior within, within society. Um, again, Adults often refer to social media as problematic because they say that the speed, the amount, and the way in which misinformation is spread, they can't, they can't totally trust how social media is being used within our society. One of the quotes that I found very interesting, um, one of the women who was interviewed during the survey said that, too much misinformation and lies are promoted from unsubstantiated sources that lead people to disregard vetted and expert information, right? So you don't know who or what to believe, right? And about one in 10 responses talk about how people on social media can be easily confused and they believe everything they see or everything they read and they're not sure what to believe. So it really comes down to the issue of trust. Can we trust this entity that has been created, that has basically taken on such a huge impact within our lives, right? And so when you think about it in that way, you know, this, this debate is really about, it is about law, right? It is about policy but it is also about the people, right, who have to live under those laws and policy. And social media and the impact that it has on our everyday lives, right? You know, a dozen years ago, it was just some, something that was, it was just simply something that was entertaining. And now it's fully integrated into every single aspect of our lives, right? Commerce, um, you know, it's integrated into commerce. It's in, you know, Alexa, turn off the lights. It's integrated into our personal lives. Um, you know, there are just so many ways, our, our workplaces um, and just at, at politics everywhere. And, you know, when, when you think about, um, you know, some of the, the skepticism that surrounds social media, you can understand why when something plays such, a, such an important and significant role in everything that we do, we have to look at it with some kind of skepticism, right? When you've got, you know, Justin Bieber tweeting, tweeting the president of the United States, you know, let those kids out of cages. When you've got, you know, so many workplace scenarios where people are being canceled or fired or in some other way, um, you know, in some other way, they're being influenced, losing their jobs and so on because of comments that they made on, you know, social media a dozen years ago, right? Um, you know, just ask the guy from Jeopardy, <laughs> right? So, you know, they're just, there's so much that, 
that social media plays within our lives. And so as quickly as it has kind of insinuated itself into every single aspect of our lives, we have to evolve just as quickly to be able to recognize and understand this change. And it's so hard for us to predict where it's going next, right? Where social media may take us next. Um, But as users of social media, and many of us as content creators of social media, we have to have the ethical understanding and we need to have, we need to gain back the trust of the American people if social media is going to be what we hope and and aspire for it to be. Okay, I think I'm going to leave it there. I hope, you know, I hope I didn't throw us too far off track, but uh, I welcome your questions. Professor Griffith, thank you very much. Uh, so, so let me ask Mike and Carl to come up and uh, take a couple mics here and then just hit the little red button to turn them on, please. And then our two state senators uh, are going to join us as well. And maybe we'll start uh, with them since they've been listening. Uh, you, you needn't have any comments. We can just roll right into questions. But I at least want to give you the opportunity either to provide a reaction or if you have a question that you would uh, like, you kind of get first privilege for asking a question. Uh, so. Uh, you can pass for now if you like, but I, I, uh, I, I want to start with you, at least give you that opportunity. It's not too late, Zach. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll simply just, I, I don't think I've got anything necessarily to add to the conversation. We can go ahead and get it started. But it was just, I, I learned a lot, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to be here. All right. Thank you very much for joining us, Senator Sinclair. And I would just echo those thanks. Um, you know, one, one thing I would say is that uh, while, while you can see Senator Wall's district from here, it, it took me the better part of three hours to find my way over here. Um, and I did that not because I, I particularly wanted to come hang out on, on campus, though you do have a lovely campus and I have appreciated my time here today, um, but because this, this issue is absolutely one of the most important issues we're facing and uh, w- without hesitation, I can say that it's, that it's difficult to find the intellectual uh, dissonance when I listen to both of you speak and, and can wholeheartedly agree with you both. Um, and, and finding the balance in, in where that comes in with the trust that we, that we place with the media. Um, I, I, I think that this is a conversation that's worthy of happen, having, and, uh, and I think that, that having that in a public square, is, as well as when, when Senator Walls and I are, are having these discussions at the Capitol, all of that needs to be taking place at this time because this is, I believe, the pivotal moment um, and, and the pivotal issue that, that faces our state, our nation. Thank you. Well, Senator, that sets the stage very well for one of the audience questions, uh, which is, uh, to our legislators, what do you see as the most important issue related to free speech and social media? So uh, not necessarily feeling confined to the vocabulary that the speakers before you have kind of been using, how would you, in your role as a state leader, articulate maybe kind of the big problem that Iowa needs to be concerned about in this area? Well, it's a, it's a good question, and it, I think, ties a couple of different things together. I, I, I think Tracy did a really nice job of, of touching on kind of the, just zooming out for a minute, free speech, social media. What is the, the bigger picture here? And, and she mentioned trust and the decline of trust. And, and I think that's certainly one of the most important and most concerning parts of this entire conversation, right? Because in, I think it was Mark Twain who said that the, a lie can get halfway around the world before truth has finished putting its boots on. And I think in the age of Twitter, that's probably doubly true, right? The lie can probably get all the way around the world, right? And, and so I think one of the, the big concerns that I have, and I think the big picture issues 
facing Iowa, facing the country is where is trust in our institutions? What is our relationship with the truth? And how, how does that interface with government, right? You know, it's, it's obviously, it's no secret at this point that there was some disagreement about the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. And this has been somewhat memory hold, but there was actually a lot of disagreement about the 2016 election too. When President Trump was elected in 2016, he alleged that he actually also won the popular vote, that there have been three million uh, fraudulent votes cast in the state of California and that he, not Secretary Clinton, had won the popular vote. Of course, that didn't materially change the outcome. He was still the president of the United States because the popular vote is not what decides the presidency in this country. But, you know, we have very strong political disagreements about empirical facts in the United States. And so when I think about what is the biggest issue, Todd, to that, to that question, I, I do think that question about the truth and what is true, I mean, not to get too philosophical, I wasn't a philosophy major, I was an engineering major, but that is, I think, the, the, the biggest part of this entire conversation. I tend to be a little bit um, blunt. I think those of you who know me in the room would, would, would agree with that. Um, I think the biggest problem with, with this conversation with free speech, with censorship, with, with, with all of it uh, is, is going to circle back to uh, our, our personal opinions about what we are entitled to. Um, when, when we set back as individuals in a society and demand that we not be offended by things that other people say, right there at the heart of it lies the crux of the issue that we're, that we're talking about, right? Um, when, when we tell, when, when Facebook, which is a private business, and I agree wholeheartedly that, that they have their terms and conditions and, and may operate as they wish, but when, but when Facebook says um, you have the right to not be offended by this other person's speech, even though everybody is free to speak, I, I think that lies at the heart of the issue. Um, and when that spills over into this conversation about what's, what, what is government's role in this process, uh, you, you've talked about, um, we've talked tonight about Texas and about, about Florida and the laws that they passed. Iowa looked at laws as well. Uh, and there's a reason Iowa looked at laws, and it's, it, it came right out of, Mike, Mike you talked about, uh, th the one thing you said that, that resonated with me the most was that in, in an era of, of tax credits and tax rebates and, and, and tiffing and, and, and using government funds and, and the, the, the power and the authority of the government trust, uh, when those same companies are, are actively and, and with, with forethought censoring speech that it deems offensive, not based on truth, but based on offense, we are tantamount to, to a government censorship of speech via big tech companies because of the money that's involved in tax credits. Um, and, and so when, when you couple those things together over, uh, on that overarching issue of, of my right to, be, to not be offended, uh, we, we have this juxtaposition and states are coming in and saying that we will not use our state funds, our state trust, to, to uh, subsidize censorship of individual speech. Um, that does violate the First Amendment, and that's where, that's where the issue, uh, I, I, I suppose, comes to, to a head in my mind. Carl? And it, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, you, you want to have limited government and free enterprise, and at the same time, you want to say free speech. And I... As I said, I, I grapple with this internally. Every time my members make a decision, I'm like, why did you do that? It, it makes me really frustrated. And we have the tendency to live in kind of a limited space where we only think about a handful of companies. Think about what? Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Uh, Snapchat is another, but we don't really talk about them. TikTok is another. They're actually the most downloaded app in the world right now. Um, and then you've got... Par I, I, yes, it's amazing. Uh, it's, 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 uh, but you got Parler, MeWe, uh, uh, 41office.com. And, and what's amazing is I actually went and uh, kind of dug through the term service privacy policies, stuff like that. 
And one of my favorites is actually from uh, Rumble. And Rumble actually has, in their terms of service, we fully support your right. Okay, so, so Rumble is a very popular conservative alternative to both YouTube and Facebook. For those of you unfamiliar, it's, it's, it, it's actually growing very, very quickly. And in their term of service, they say, we, we want to, it's, I'm paraphrasing, we essentially want to uphold First Amendment rights and free speech and not content moderate. Having said that, we reserve the right to remove anything that we find offensive, objectionable, lewd, lascivious, or otherwise inappropriate for our site. So even platforms that build their foundation on just being an open platform quickly run headlong into the need to engage in content moderation. That's when it becomes really, really hard. The other problem from like the tech side is that we are getting, we're, we're kind of like the kid in uh, a, an unhappy household where you got both parents yelling at each other and they're asking us to pick favorites. And I, I don't know what was on the mind of Mark Zuckerberg when he gave a speech. Back in about 2017, 2018, he gave a speech at Georgetown University that he wants to begin expanding and make it much more about free speech, and they seem to have pivoted a different direction once the administration changed. That's not good for anybody. What's good is for businesses to be able to operate freely, to decide what is best for their users and their customers and let alternatives grow, and for the government to step back because I think you will see less politically based content moderation if we don't live in fear of trying to appease whomever is in power, trying to figure out what they want. Senator Hawley, of all people, just the other day berated Facebook for not doing enough content moderation when it came to protecting teenage girls. At the same time, he's advancing legislation to eliminate Section 230 and break them up. So we literally don't know what to do, and, and that's one of the biggest problems that we face is we're trying to appease two masters who are diametrically opposed, and when we should be focusing on our, our real concern, which is our advertiser and customers. Uh, just respond briefly sure. to something Carl just said. I, w one thing that stood out uh, from Mike's remarks was about speed. Uh, you talked briefly about the Hunter Biden story that was in the New York Post, and then you also made uh, a reference to changing COVID science. Uh, both COVID science obviously changing uh, on a daily basis. And the Hunter Biden story, I think what I think got a lot of people's attention about that was it was a breaking news story, obviously, when it emerged. For those of us who don't live in Washington, it was news, right, to us. I, apparently, there had been some speculation in uh, the swamp that that story might be coming. But out here, it was, it was news to most of us. Um, but what I think both of those things speak to is, and Carl said something that's made me think about it, is just how quickly information moves on the internet. And we think about 1996, and one of the things that was different, and you made this point, was that the internet was much more distributed, and today it's so much more concentrated on the major or largest platforms, and obviously a lot of their value comes from the network effects of having everybody on the platform, which is why there's this sense that they're the new public square. But I think there's this interesting, this challenge that policymakers have of trying to figure out how do you balance the speed, the, the speed element with the veracity element, right? Because obviously, it, to the Mark Twain quote, it takes time to verify something is true or not true. And the claim about, you know, is this Hunter Biden story Russian disinformation, whether it was or wasn't, was in hindsight maybe clear, but at the moment was obviously a difficult question to, to make. And, and of course, the, we have these, these challenges of trying to overlearn the lessons of the past. Um, but that's a, that's a real hard question for policy makers to grapple with. And I think that's part of what's unfortunate about so much of this debate is that it, it goes into this, this space where we have people talking about being censored or what have you for their political views when there are like much bigger conversations that I think are largely bipartisan. It sounds like maybe Senator Klobuchar and Senator Paul or uh, Grassley are working on, on that in DC. Maybe that's, maybe that's happening. Mike, let me uh, see if I can weave together a couple of questions here. Uh, they cohere in my mind. Let's see if they cohere when they come out of my mouth. Uh, someone has asked a question whether you know about a, a, a decentralized alternative to Twitter called Mastodon, an open source software. Uh, if you know about that and wish to comment on it, I open the door. But I can ask it also more broadly. Do you see any room for there to, uh, to be a market? I'm thinking here specifically for comments about any trust. Do you see any room for a, a market solution? Uh, and if not, 
what is the barrier that prevents there from being a market solution that requires government intervention and and how do we know when we hit that threshold you know the group of people in this room decide that they're going to form an online group so they can talk to each other so they can stay in touch and it turns out to be popular and people kind of join when how do we know when we hit the threshold we say oh, okay now we got a problem because the people in this room have become more than just the people in this room and look at how they're handling their speech and who they're excluding from their group how do we mark that point? So kind of weaving together, if you can, if you know something about Mastodon or other kind of alternatives that might obviate the need for uh, government intervention. I have never heard of that platform, but I will, I will Google okay. it. I'm going to give you this card because there's some description <laughs> at length about it, and so there's... I'll tell you about Mastodon. Great. I will look at that. Okay. Um, I would just step back and say I think big tech was going along pretty well for a decade, from 2010 to 2020. Um, and they were going along pretty well because they were making a lot of money. Uh, no one was complaining about their monopolies, or very few people were complaining about their monopolies, and uh, they could have just continued to make a lot of money. And I think where they made a big mistake is where they started to politically censor, right? They used, um, we, we, Carl calls it the Good Samaritan Clause, uh, subsection C2, the otherwise objectionable to do their censorship, right? And that's where they got into trouble. Uh, there were a lot of Republicans, even like me, who would have said, look, this is, these are corporations. I don't like government meddling with these corporations. We have free markets. Um, if, censor, if Twitter wants to kick Mike Davis off his platform for the fifth time, that's, that's, that's Twitter's uh, prerogative as a private company. And, I think generally people would have agree, agree with that uh, uh, two years ago, and I think a lot has changed. And the reason a lot has changed is people are waking up to the fact that big tech has too much power. Like they control the online public square. They, they control the political discourse in this country. It happens on Facebook. It happens on Twitter. Like I said, it doesn't happen on the Ped Mall or the TN Cleary walkway. Um, and so the biggest political problem that big tech created was they lost a lot of the, of the conservatives. They lost a lot of the right. And that's why you're seeing uh, the Josh Hawleys of the world and, and increasingly a lot more people, even Chuck Grassley, uh, wanting to rein in big tech. So I think that a lot of the problems that big tech is experiencing with antitrust uh, and Section 230 is self-inflicted. If they would have just s stuck to being free speech platforms and got rid of the child porn and got rid of the terrorist beheadings, which you, you, if you go online, you can, you can still see the terrorist beheadings on these platforms, but they're, they, they kick conservatives off. Um, they would have just not been political, they would not have these problems. And so once they became political, people started to look at their market power, right? They started to look at the fact that these are trillion dollar monopolists and they are using their market power to uh, kick half of the country off the internet, right? And that's just not sustainable. It's, it's not a sustainable business model. It's just not sustainable for our oh, country. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, so wait a minute. Wait, sorry. Hey, sorry. Griffith, go ahead. They're still conservatives on Twitter. <laughs> uh, hey, Professor Griffith? No, I'm saying, but they're no, being... Hang, hang on, let's bring in Professor Griffith here, and then we'll carry on. It's just a little harder for her to cut in, because she's... Since oh, she's go ahead. No, I, was, I was just going to ask, so you're, so you're saying that political speech, right, the, the most protected form of speech, to enable a democracy to exist should not be on social media? No, it should be. I think is, it should be. What I'm saying is, is that you need, if you're, that, 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 that political speech has gone online. It's not, it's not on the ped ball anymore. It's not on the TN Cleary walkway. It's online. And you can't have these uh, monopolists kicking half of, half of the country off these. You can't have the monopolist say that only people who agree with our political views can be on our platforms, right? Um, it, I, that's the, that's the political problem that, that, that big tech faces, and that's why they're seeing these six antitrust bills pass through the House Judiciary Committee uh, with Republican support. This is why you're going to see big tech broken up by the end of this Congress uh, through legislation because, of this, because they've angered the, the, the conservatives. They've angered Republicans, uh, and that's what I'm saying. I, whether that's right or wrong, that's the reality. That's, what's, that's what big tech has brought on themselves. Um, and Professor Pettis was talking about what's a market solution to this problem. Well, we tried this. Uh, we tried a market solution with Parler. Um, again, after the, uh, during the election, after the election, a lot of conservatives uh, were disgusted with Parler for their censorship. They censored a sitting president of the United with States. Twitter. I, or excuse me, Twitter. I, I, I apologize, Twitter. Right. I get that President Trump is 
would probably get one vote in this room, uh, and, and he's not a, a popular figure, but he was a sitting president of the United States, and he was kicked off of Twitter. Um, and so that angered a lot of people. You saw a lot of people go into Parler, right? Uh, you saw a $1.3 billion valuation in, par in Parler. And so uh, that would be a market correction uh, to the censor censorship problem, but for the facts that you had Apple and Google, the, the App Store duopoly, kicking Parler out of the App Store, and then Amazon Web Services kicking Parler off the internet. So those were, the, the, these monopolists were colluding to kill a uh, startup competitor to Twitter. Um, so th that's the problem. That's, that's why you can't have these monopolists in the market, because they're using their market power to crush competition. Senator Walls and uh, Carl, you both have wanted in on this. Well, and Parler is back on the App Store, right? Correct. Right. They are, they, are, they, are, they are back in the App Store with their valuation significantly diminished because they were kicked out of the App Store and kicked off the internet for months. But they are back. They are back, sure. And they're back on the internet? They are back, sure. Uh, but, they are, but they are back with a significantly lower value, valuation where they're not a true competitor to Twitter anymore. Is there anything structurally, just so I understand, because, uh, that, is prevent, that prevents people now from moving to Parler? Or you're saying just people have they so they had they, so they, they Parler, kind of Parler did concept, have to correct? agree to the App Store terms and services. They mm -hmm. had to they had to they had to in, they had to implement a uh, I, I, for a lack of a better word they had to a content moder moderation mm -hmm. policy that mm -hmm. that can uh, that conform to Apple. Right. The, the problem was is it was the timing. The, mm -hmm. the timing was and, the, and big tech knew this. The timing was that all of these conservatives. Were ready to jump ship from mm -hmm. Twitter to Parler, and so there was they, the big the big tech monopolist just coincidentally uh, decided on the same day to kick uh, Parler out of the app stores and kick Parler off the internet. There was no collusion whatsoever. Okay. Carl looks befuddled. So we'll yeah. Find out so why. one one of the important <laughs> so one of the things that I, I I love about my job is I get to look at things in a macro level. So couple of things. The timing of that was not coincidental. It was all January 7th. Um, 6th, 6th. January 6th, January 7th. And as you can imagine, there was a lot of activity going on. So why do platforms do the content moderation they do? And it ultimately comes back to advertisers at the end of the day. One of the things that they we've seen is, we saw this a couple of months ago, was an exodus of businesses from YouTube. And why was that? because their ads were being run alongside objectionable content. Uh, let's see, Dasani Water probably doesn't want to be run alongside certain pieces of content. And when their ads were being run alongside, they left the platform, and that forces the platforms to engage in content. Sorry, I didn't mean to incept you and grab a water bottle, but um, it, it forced them to engage in a level of content moderation. We actually. Uh, there, there's a website out there called businessnotbias.org, and it basically walks through what is content moderation. The other thing that we're seeing here, and, and by the way, if to the extent that all these platforms colluded, we actually have an opportunity for every state AG and the U.S. Federal Trade Commission to and Department of Justice take an enforcement action today under what's called Section One of the Sherman Antitrust Act. So it's multi-party collusion to stop a competitor. So to the extent that anyone can actually prove collusion, there's an enforcement mechanism with significant penalties under existing antitrust law today that can be leveraged. Now, one of the things that we are seeing since Senator Grassley's bill was brought up, uh, and, uh, along with Senator Klobuchar, um, and, and one of the benefits of being a Hill lobbyist is, is lobbyists oftentimes get the opportunity to see legislation before lawmakers. It's a horrible practice. It shouldn't happen, <laughs> but it does. Um, and so th just some things to take back to your, to, your, to your senator. The legislation that they're currently working on uh, basically has prohibitions. And the way it's crafted is very clever because it basically says, Unless your name, it, it might as well be written, unless you are Apple, Facebook, Google, and Amazon, because some they give an escape valve for Microsoft, wh whose valuation is $2 trillion. Um, they, uh, but unless you're those four businesses, it doesn't apply to you, which in and of itself is a violation of the Constitution. You can't write a law to criminalize a person. You write a law to criminalize an act. But uh, one of the components is it, you may not engage in, uh, you can't prioritize your own service. Seems like a good rule, right? 
Well, what does that mean? That means when I do a search for, and I'm gonna go back to my which which example, I go to search for which which in Google, and what do I see? I see the name of the website, a link, and a map of exactly where it is so I know how to walk to it. Well, that's Google Maps. They can't prioritize that. Instead, they'd be forced to give you a bunch of links if you wanted to know where they were to, to MapQuest, and basically every other map service, and theirs would actually have to be dead last because they couldn't prioritize themselves. Another priority feature uh, under this legislation, because you can't prioritize your own service, when you get your new Android or Apple device, you can't have Apple Mail or Google Mail pre-installed because then you're pre prioritizing your own services. I don't know about you, I have enough tech difficulties with my own dad to begin with. I don't need to teach him how to install mail or a web browser, that would be horrible. Uh, another would be you can't condition provision of a service on customers buying another service. Well, what does that mean in practice? It sounds like a good idea. Well, when I sign up for Prime, Amazon Prime, because I like my free two-day delivery, I get Prime Video free. I can't sign up for Prime Video, but I can sign up for Amazon Prime, and as a result of some of their value, you know, the value add, I get Prime Video. That would be illegal under this proposed legislation. So one of the things that we're seeing, and getting back to the issue at large, is a knee-jerk reaction. A knee-jerk reaction from what Mike properly identifies as a frustration point. It's, it's what, you know, censorship or perceived removal or bias or whatever. And what do we do? How do we punish these bad businesses for hurting me, removing what I, I believe I'm entitled to? Well, we punish them through either changing laws regarding content moderation or quote unquote, break them up. And neither of which I think will ultimately satisfy our desire to get on the platforms, have access to the speech. And the conservative side of me says, let's create alternatives. And we have seen over at least half a dozen conservative alternatives be created. And to the extent that there's collusion to stop them, I tell the government, go forth and prosecute with the most expedited process. So there's a lot to unpack, but government is rarely the solution. Can I make one? Follow up. Sure. Can, so, the reason that Parler does not have the, actually Parler did bring an antitrust case when they when when these uh, these big tech platforms colluded to kill them, and the there was a motion to dismiss filed and they were going to lose this. Uh, Parler was going to lose this antitrust claim, and the reason is we we have these uh, we have the the Sherman Act that's been on the books for a century, and it is a, a very strong law. It's a very clear law. And it basically says you can't collude to kill co competition, right, in this country. I mean, that's, that's the layman's terms. There's, there, it's, a lot, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But what has happened is starting about 40 years ago, conservative academics uh, with Judge Bork and others at the Chicago School came up with this theory called the Consumer Welfare Standard. Um, I like Justice Scalia, I clerk for just, Justice Gorsuch. I'm a conservative. I helped Trump put all these conservative judges on the bench, which I know this crowd really loves. Um, and you keep making assumptions about this group, <laughs> and I want to speak up in their defense. <laughs> I hear you. They've been you guys have been great. I'm, I'm joking about that. Okay. Uh, but I would just say that um, the, the, this is where I part ways with, with the conservatives on this. As conservatives, we're supposed to be textualists. We're supposed to look at the text and follow the text, and we're also supposed to look at the original public meaning of that text, textualism and originalism. What the, the Chicago School did with Judge Bork 40 years ago is they essentially rewrote the Sherman Act on behalf of big corporations to make it hard to bring, uh, to, to make it more difficult to bring antitrust lawsuits against corporations. And the problem with the consumer welfare standard is that it does not apply very well to big tech because the consumer welfare standard looks at price and output. And if you look at big tech, it's free. You have, you know, it's allegedly free, it's not free. They're not trillion dollar monopolists because they're giving out freebies all day. They, big tech takes as much data as they can on you. They try to keep, their own, keep them on their platforms as long as they can. They try to find out as much information as they can about you through your searches and your activities online and they sell you to advertisers. That's how they make their trillions of dollars, right? The problem is that you get Google searches, Google Maps, Gmail, uh, these, these so-called you know, free services, you, you, you're not paying a price for them in, in, in terms of, of currency, in terms of paying you know, $5 per internet search, you're paying with your data. And so that's why mm -hmm. with, this, with this consumer welfare standard, it doesn't apply to big tech very, very neatly, and that's why they've been able to evade antitrust scrutiny, like Parler just lost uh, their antitrust claim because of this. 
We have uh, a <laughs> professor. Griff, go ahead. I'm going to bring the group back to your your big question, but go ahead just briefly. And I was going to say that this is very interesting because this ACLU person totally agrees with you. We we are no longer the consumer. We are the product. That's exactly. And right. as long as we are the product and our information is the product, this is not going. It's it's we're just we're just the problem is going to be exacerbated. Right, because I think you're absolutely right. So I, I agree with you. I just I wanted to say that because you've been you know casting aspersions on the rest of the room. I'm not in the room, but I agree with you. <laughs> I know. Essentially, so. this antitrust issue brings together the left and the right. It really does. You, like I was saying in my prepared remarks, David Cicilline was a Trump impeachment manager. Ken Buck is a conservative Republican from Colorado. Uh, Chuck Grassley is a conservative Republican senator. A.B. Klobuchar is a liberal from Minnesota. This is, this is an issue that brings together all sides. Uh, we've got just three or four minutes left, I think. Is that right, uh, Pete? So let me just ask this last question uh, of each of you who wishes to speak to it. Professor Griffith talked about public trust and kind of charted for us this steady decline uh, of public trust in public institutions and so forth. We have representatives of members of public institutions and those who really have devoted their lives uh, to different parts of it. And when you just think about the various alternatives on offer, we have government intervention, we have uh, just kind of un unfiltered, unregulated free speech, some opportunities in between. When you think about how best to restore public trust such that we would tell a story five or ten years from now that because of the way we've handled free speech and social media, uh, controversies at this moment in time. We've actually turned things around and American people are starting to trust again in media. They're starting to trust again in elected officials. How would that show itself best here? It's a big question with not much time and there's five of you, okay? <laughs> but whoever wants to go, but maybe just kind of as a closing statement, uh, articulating your, your view in, in those terms. Yeah, well, look, I mean, government can't solve every problem. And you know we all we all know that's true. And, and I think that what we have to keep our, our focus on here is the fact that you know the, the proximate cause of everything that we're talking about tonight, the reason why you know Mike and, and so many other conservatives were angry at, at Twitter and at Facebook and at Apple, was really a reaction to what happened on January 6th in 2021. Uh, that was the direct result of a president who launched his campaign saying that he could get away with shooting a man on Fifth Avenue, and who ended his presidency by instructing the people who were assembled outside the White House to march down Pennsylvania Avenue. And that anger was because of this contested, from his perspective, election in 2020. And there are a lot of different views on election integrity, Voter fraud is a frequent conversation at the State House, and Democrats have very strong views about voter suppression. Uh, but I think, Todd, to answer the question, if, if we're getting to a point where things are getting better, it's going to be because people believe in the outcome of elections. People believe that people had access to the ballot box and that those votes were accurately counted. And how we kind of square that circle, I'm not completely sure. If, if you've got any ideas, Amy, I'd love to hear them. But I, I think if you want to get to really what's at the root of this, and what I think causes the most stress for me is I think about the long term, not even just the long term, but frankly 2022, 2024, what those concerns look like. It's, can our democracy function? Can we have bipartisan belief in the outcome of elections okay. without you. violent insurrection? I others, hope so. Others of the four of you. Senator Sinclair. So how do we how do we move forward? Why are we here? And how do we move forward with a positive outcome? I want all of you in this room to know that Senator Walls and I vote identically probably 90, 92 percent of the time. Maybe 85. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot. I mean, if we're including all your amendments, then yeah, it does go down to 80 or 85. Um, on final passage, we're often on the same page on, on the bulk of the bills that go through. The problem comes into the fact that the bulk of the bills that go through, the bulk of the work that we do in the legislature, the day-to-day -day, uh, work that we do to make Iowans lives better is largely ignored because it's not controversial and it doesn't sell advertising. 
I will never forget early on in my time in the Senate, I woke up getting ready for, for to, to, to go to the Capitol. I had small kids, so I drove home every night. But I, I woke up at, at 6 o'clock or whatever and clicked on the, the, the news to, to see what the weather was going to be so I knew how to dress for the day. And I heard myself misquoted. And I'm like, my gosh, I didn't say that. But what I said wouldn't have sold any advertising. So three words were left out to make it controversial. It, we won't have a positive outcome in this until until our, our media, until our news outlets stop selling themselves and start reporting what is actually happening. Start reporting that Senator Walls and I agree that we should stop human trafficking and we work hard to make that happen. It's not gonna happen until, until social media, your big tech companies, stop censoring the fact that, that you know, I might be out there working on behalf of, of creating new mental health provider positions because to say that a Republican was doing that might, might not sell the news that they want it to do. Those, it's not going to happen until big tech and, and big news stop trying to sell themselves rather than trying to report on what's actually happening, that as a society we work together and, and we, can, we can find the common ground when it's necessary. That's when we have a better outcome, is, is when uh, the advertising dollars stop overriding the truth. Okay. Pete, you're not going to fire me if it's 9.05 or something when I'm done here, are you? Okay. I've got, I've got three more. Okay. And Professor Griffiths, I, this, this is your big sure. question. You can go now or you can go last. No, I'm, I'll go now. I, I, I totally agree that, yes, I think you're right, that the media has, has abdicated its responsibility um, to be those watchdogs, to speak the truth, to, you know, to challenge those in power. I agree. The media has abdicated its responsibility, but they're not alone, right? They're not alone. Those four institutions that I talked about, include, one including the media, but there are three others, right? And, and business, they, they've got to protect privacy. They've got to, they've got to drive economic prosperity. Um, you know, they've got to provide jobs and training. I mean, Business has a role to play in all of this. All of these institutions have to fulfill their trust building mandates, right? They, they must step up. So, you know, business has a responsibility. Government has a responsibility too. Government has to, you know, aid in driving that economic prosperity. They have to investigate corruption, right? They have to, they have to protect the poor or the people who are marginalized. Same thing with non-governmental organizations, right? They have, they have a role in all of this too. They've got to call out abuses of power. They've also got to create a sense of community because the larger community that, we, that we're seeing ourselves as, part, as a part of in terms of you know, social media, it's worldwide. And we're seeing a lot of this you know, questioning, questionable trust activities that are, it's, it's worldwide. It's not just within the United States. But yes, I think you're absolutely right. Media has got to guard information quality Everybody thinks they can be a, you know, a journalist nowadays. Why? Because they can, they can shoot TikToks. No, there, there's a standard. Media has to, to guard that information, right? The quality of the information that they're putting out there so that you aren't misquoted. They have to, they have to keep educating and informing. And yeah, the other, I guess entertainment is a part of it as well. But, you know, educating and informing the public, that's the role of the media. And then also protecting privacy, Right. You know, there, there's a large part of uh, the of that issue that we that we didn't really jump into tonight. But you know, there are a lot, there are a lot of issues of privacy that that are significant that we need to think about as well. So all four of these institutions have roles to play, and they need to step up and do what they need to do to be able to build trust back in in the American population. Otherwise, I think you're absolutely right that our democracy is going to suffer. Right? You know, elections. Right, believing in the viability of elections and the outcome of elections is just one aspect of it that was on display for us on January 6th. But all four of these institutions have roles to play. Okay, Carl and Mike, we're at nine o'clock, but please take a couple of minutes each. So when surveys were done recently and, and not too much surprise, trust in, in government was not super high. Uh, Conversely, and, and not well, I will toot the horn of several of my members, trust in services like 
Google and Amazon and Apple are, are actually very high amongst users. So one of the problems we're, we, A, we haven't fully identified what's the problem we're trying to solve. We're upset about a lot of stuff, so what are we trying to solve? And then work backwards towards a solution, because I often find if you're not looking for an exit, you don't know where to start. But if I were to walk up and down the street and I said, the solution will be, I'm going to make it harder for Amazon to deliver you packages in two days low cost. I don't think that's going to engender a lot of user trust. Uh, I want to make it harder for small businesses to be found or advertised. I don't think that's going to engender a lot of trust. These, these are the quote unquote break up approaches. Um, I also don't trust government to dictate what speech should or should not be on a private business because then you're going to be worried, well, it's not my person in power. Are they modifying the content moderation based on the other party? And, and then it's going to snap back the other way once the other party's in power. So I think that's going to sometimes create distrust. Kind of Carl speaking for Carl, you know, I, I grew up on, on newspapers like the Washington Post, New York Times, many others. And nowadays, I will pull up the WashingtonPost.com or New York Times or, or many, many, several others, and I'll play the article or opinion game. And it's really hard to figure out where news and opinion break. I don't know how we encourage news media itself to get back to reporting the news. I, I know that uh, WGN is actually trying a, an effort on that. and. Uh, I, I, I hope it works because that's where I think the ultimate breakdown is. If most people don't actually go to social media for their news, most people go to uh, the number one source for news for people is still broadcast and, and, and cable. Number two is actually the websites of newspapers and news websites. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, we're, we're actually substantially lower, and that's the way it should be. You should go to the news media for news. The problem is people don't know who to trust. And so if the problem is we need to start doing trust, then we need to create incentives for the news media to start building that trust so that when I go to CNN, I can know that they're not taking a side. When I can go to uh, the Washington Post, New York Times, uh, local newspapers here, elsewhere, that they can just give me the news and then they can report that you're doing great work, or that a majority of the Supreme Court decisions are 9-0 or 8-1, not 5-4 or 6-3 as it's often produced. So that's where I think the ultimate solution is. Uh, that I don't know how we get there. I, I, I would really hope that the next generation of journalists decide to become news reporters, not opinion editors. And from that, I think that's where we begin building. Okay, Mike, you get the last word. I will be what? very fast. I think if we want to rebuild confidence in our institutions, we need more competition. We need more transparency. We need more freedom of speech. We need, we need people to feel like they're actually participating in these institutions and they're not being censored, canceled, marginalized, radicalized. Thank you to all of the panelists. I'll call Pete Damiano up to give us our benediction for the evening. <laughs> First up, I just want to please join me in thanking our panelists tonight and all our speakers. And Todd, you did a great night, great job moderating this discussion. I think we all saw how easy these issues are, and we're all <laughs> going to have the, the easy solutions. But it, there's obviously this thread of trust that ran through everything that we were talking about, and that's something that is so difficult, and we all know, you know, whether it's more government regulation, less government regulation, more private sector regulation, less. There all has challenges with all of those things, and they all relate to that trust. But I think that's something, whether it's trust in elections or that comes out of social media or just the trust in social media, those are things that we're all going to be struggling with for a long time. And I, I think you all have done a great job of really helping to, to highlight that, whether it's at the national level or the state level and what the challenges that we're facing. I uh, would love to give a little shout out to some of the staff from the Public Policy Center, Leslie Gannon and Juliana Lee. Uh, please join me in thanking them for putting this together. And Nick Tomlanovich and the, the group that's, that helped bring Tracy in virtually and helped uh, everyone who is watching online and will be able to watch later. So thank you for your help with this. 
So while the old Capitol is a beautiful building, it's not easy tech-wise. It wasn't exactly thought of back in the day that we were going to be doing technology in here. Uh, one more shout out for the next two parts of this series. So they're not policy topics, but they're about things that affect policy. So in October, um, October 14th, we're going to be talking about the future of the Democratic Party. I believe we will have a very solid journalist as a part of that panel, UI alumnus Sungan Kim from the Washington Post. And she's winning also the Alumni of the Year Award from the University of Iowa. Very proud of that. And then on November 10th, the future of the Republican Party. And you'll see we're bringing in a very diverse perspective on both of those. And I hope you can join us for that. So thank you again for caring about this issue and participating tonight. Thank you all. Thank you.